Hey, good morning, everyone, and welcome back to Morning Musings. Enjoying a great cup of coffee. Uh, I am kind of a coffee addict. Boy, yeah, uh, I absolutely love good coffee. I, I have a, a bun coffee maker uh, in another room there. Uh, man, when I hit the office about 4 o'clock of the morning, it's on, and I drink coffee basically all morning long. <laughs> but, you know, if you drink coffee, it's good for your heart. <laughs> um, that, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it, right? All right. My name is Don K. Preston. I am the president of Preterist Research Institute of Ardmore, Oklahoma, and this is what I call my morning musings. I do appreciate you being with me here on Now TV. I hope that you'll tell your friends. I hope you'll tell your neighbors about this program. And I hope, you know, if you have questions, and I hope you do, if you have questions or comments, about anything that I say here on Now TV, go to my website, donkpreston.com, bibleprophecy.com, and on the contact tab, just contact, send, send me an email. And if you'd like for me to answer your question here on Now TV, just let me know. Now, I won't give your full name. I certainly will not give out your contact information. I will not betray your confidentiality, okay? I, I hold that in the highest esteem and respect. So I never betray anyone's uh, personal uh, in information. So uh, I'm pretty sure, all right, I am pretty sure that I've said some things here uh, on my program, which appears here on Now TV, 930 Central Time, every Friday morning. I'm pretty sure that I've said some things that are pretty shocking to you. I'm pretty sure I've said some things that are very challenging. I'm pretty sure that I've said some things that, that when you initially heard me say them, you're like, what? What? That's crazy. Uh, I can assure you that when I very first started studying on my own and seeing what the Bible was, was saying for really the first time, I began to go, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's not what my dad taught me. That's not what grandpa taught me. That's not what I was taught in seminary. So believe me, I understand. I understand the challenge. I, I understand the shock of hearing someone get on TV and say, I believe the Lord came in AD 70. Because you see, I was raised with the same concept of the day of the Lord that you probably were raised with. I was raised believing that every time I saw the term day of the Lord, coming of the Lord, et cetera, et cetera, I believed that that was talking about the end of time. I believed that that was talking about the time in which Jesus as a five foot five Jewish man riding on a little literal cumulus cloud would come out of heaven and heaven and earth would be destroyed. That was my concept. And I believed it fervently. I taught it. I preached it. I wrote about it. I debated it until I began to realize that that's not a biblical idea at all. It's not what the Bible teaches. And so, again, I understand the shock. Uh, the <laughs> yeah, I understand. But I want to tell you something. Let me share something with you. Over the years, I have had any number of people, probably hundreds of people, who have heard my radio program. And by the way, every Tuesday evening on Blog Talk Radio, William Bell, my partner, he and I have a program called Two Guys and a Bible. You can go to www.blogtalkradio slash fulfilled radio. Uh, fulfilled radio and look it up. And every Tuesday evening, 6 o'clock Central Time, William Bell discussed a lot of the very things that you and I are discussing here on this program. Oh, by the way, William Bell also has a program here on Now TV every Saturday afternoon. Be sure to tune in to William's program. I, I tell you, William is one of, one of the finest Bible teachers I have ever known. I have to tell you that. Uh, it, he has been such a blessing to me in my life. So look him up, William Bell on Now TV. It will be a tremendous blessing to you. So once again, 
I have had any number of people tell me, you know, I've, I've heard you on the radio. I've read a book or two. I read an article or two. And by the way, on my websites, there are literally hundreds upon hundreds of articles for you to read totally free of charge. No obligation whatsoever. So these individuals have told me, look, I heard what you're saying, and, and I decided to listen to you a little bit. I decided to read, uh, read your books a little bit so that I could prove you wrong. I was go going to contact you and prove you wrong. One of my best friends in the world right now came to a Bible class, a men's Bible class that I was teaching years ago because he heard what I was teaching, and he said, well, I'll just attend that class and I'll prove Preston wrong. That'll be easy. Wasn't so easy. And he is a now an incredibly excited student of the Bible and teaching the fulfillment of Christ's prophecy to come in the first century. So once again, I understand. Hey, look, if you want to contact me and say, Preston, I can prove you wrong, here, here's, here's my comment. If you can prove me wrong, I will recant and I will repent. I was raised as a fifth generation member of the amillennial view of eschatology. I know that view inside, out, up, down, sideways, any way you want to, want to describe it. As I mentioned a moment ago, I taught it. I preached it, I debated it, but I abandoned that view because it is not in the Bible. And as I compared the other views, postmillennialism, dispensationalism, historical premillennialism, when I compared them with what the Bible actually teaches, I could not go there either. I tried really, really, really hard. And this is kind of a personal testimony to me here. I tried really, really, really hard to hold on to some form of a futurist eschatology. I started writing a book on Romans chapter 8 because I believed, although I had seen all of these other verses that were talking about the imminent coming of the Lord in the first century, I believe that Romans chapter 8, okay, there, there's my fortress. There's the hill I'm going to die on. Romans chapter 8, without any doubt whatsoever, proves the Lord's coming back at the end of time. So I set out to write a book. Proving that, okay, there was an at-hand coming of the Lord, a soon coming of the Lord. That was A.D. 70 when the Lord came in the glory of the Father as I've been sharing with you here, he came as the Father had come many times in the Old Testament. Okay, that was in AD 70, when Jesus, exercising the sovereignty uh, prerogative of judgment, as he said in John 5, 21 and following, from henceforth the Father judges no one, but is committed all judgment to the Son, that all men may judge, uh, may honor the Son as they honor the Father. Henceforth, the Father judges no one. you catch that? The Son can do nothing of Himself, but what He sees the Father do, He will do likewise. Here is Jesus unequivocally stating that He was going to act in judgment in the very same way He had seen His Father act in judgment. How had He seen His Father act in judgment? He had never seen the Father come out of heaven in a literal physical body. He had never seen his father come literally, visibly, bodily with the angels with a shout in flaming fire and burning up heaven and earth, had he? And so you see, as I begin to see all of these things myself, I realized that my eschatology was wrong, or so I thought, so I hung on to Romans chapter 8. Like I said, I looked at Romans chapter 8, that's the hill I'm going to die on. So, boy, I'm just riding away, I'm researching, I'm digging into the Greek, I'm digging in into all of the words in the text, and I got to a certain point. And I got scared. That's right. I got scared. Why? 
because I realize that eminence permeates Romans chapter 8. And guess what? If, no, since eminence permeates Romans 8, that means that permanence, excuse me, eminence permeates 1 Corinthians 15 and 2 Corinthians 5. I begin seeing that without any shadow of a doubt, whatever it was that Paul was expecting in Romans chapter 8, he was expecting it very soon. There is no concept in Romans chapter 8 of an eschatology to be fulfilled 2,000 years and counting away. So yeah, I got scared. The hill that I had said, okay, I'm going to die on this because uh, this, is, this was not at hand when Paul wrote, and I discovered it was at hand when Paul wrote, and that meant that I had no text to appeal to for a futurist eschatology. I laid the manuscript aside. And I didn't touch it because I was scared. And finally, as I looked myself in the mirror day after day after do, day, I realized, you know, Don, you're not being honest. Your fear is just fear of being put out of the synagogue. And that's not a good kind of fear. So I had to have a good long talk with myself and essentially to say, I really don't care what the Bible says. I'm going to accept it no matter the cost. So I accepted it. And that's what has led me to where I am today as I am sharing with you here on Now TV the reality that Christ not only said he was coming back in the lifetime of the first century saints and believers, but that the New Testament apostles echoed those very sentiments and that Jesus either kept his word or he lied and he failed. If he lied and if he failed, he is not my Savior and he's not your Savior. I could not engage in cognitive dissonance. What in the world is cognitive dissonance? Okay. Cognitive dissonance is saying is something that we as human beings have a nasty habit of doing and that is of having embraced an idea, a concept, a thought, a doctrine, etc., knowing and realizing that it's wrong, but continuing to teach it anyway. That's cognitive dissonance. I couldn't do that. I had to make up my mind that no matter what the cost, and believe you me, there was a lot of cost, but no matter what the cost, I was going to study, I was going to learn, I was going to accept what the Bible said, what Jesus said, what his apostles said about when the end of the age was going to be. And I realized that from the very first of the New Testament to the very last page of Revelation, that there are literally hundreds of statements about the eminence, the first century eminence of the coming of the Lord, the judgment, the judgment of the living and the dead, which is the resurrection. The first century saints believed and taught the end was near 2,000 years ago. Well, I've been sharing with you <clears throat> over the last couple of weeks one attempt to explain away Jesus' prediction in Matthew 16, 27, and 28. The ground of Jesus' challenge, the challenge of Christ. Remember? The Son of Man will come in the glory of the Father with his angels and shall reward every man according as his work shall be. And verily I say unto you, there are some standing here which shall not taste of death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And so one of the attempts 
as I shared with you last week, to negate that or to say, well, it was fulfilled, not literally, not objectively, but by vision, is that just a few days later, Jesus took his disciples up onto the top of a mountain, and there he was transfigured before them. And I'm going to read Matthew chapter 17 and, and the relevant verses again, because this, this is such an incredible text. I, I, my mind is blown every single time I read about the transfiguration. Okay. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. His face shined like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. While he was speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the heaven, or out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces, and they were greatly afraid. You reckon? Scared out of their minds would be how we might express that. But Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, do not be afraid. When they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Now, as they came down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, See that you do not tell the vision to any man until after the Son of Man is raised from the dead. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then do the scribes say, Elijah must come first? Jesus answered and said to them, Indeed, indeed Elijah is coming first and will restore all things, but I say to you, Elijah has come already. And they did not know him, but did to him whatsoever they wished. Likewise, the Son of Man is also about to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he spoke to them of John the Baptist. Look, the, the, the Transfiguration is, without any doubt whatsoever, one of the most awe-inspiring visions in the entirety of the Bible. And make no mistake, it was a vision. Now, let's not be mistaken here. What does the word vision mean? We might think, oh, well, it's kind of like a dream. I had a dream last night that I was a millionaire. Well, you know, it wasn't real. <laughs> I had a dream last night that I, had, I owned a 66 Le Mans, a Shelby Le Mans Coupe. Uh, yeah, there were only five of those made. Yeah, that's a dream. It's not real. That is not how the term vision is being used. The word vision here is referring to the concrete, the objective vision of what they saw. It is not being used in the sense of some imaginary, ethereal, uh, strictly mental, and non-actual visual experience. <clears throat> so let's make no mistake. What they saw was real. What they saw was a vision. Now then, very first point that I want to share with you is this. When someone says, yes, Jesus said he was going to come back with the angels in the glory of the Father, before all the people standing there died, point number one, Jesus did not say, Verily I say unto you, there are some standing here, which shall not taste of death, taste of death until they see a vision of my coming. He said, They will see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now, let me point something out that's very, very important. In Mark chapter 9, verse 1, 
which is the direct parallel to Matthew 16, 28. The wording of that text in the Greek goes something like this. There are some standing here which shall not taste of death until they have seen that the Son of Man had come in His power and glory. Do you catch the power of this? They will not taste death. They won't die until they see that the Son of Man had come in the kingdom with power and great glory. Here's what that means. Here's the force of the Greek of Mark chapter 9 verse 1. The force of the Greek is some of that audience. By the way, I'll, I'll comment on this more in, in a moment. But Mark chapter 8 makes it clear there was a great multitude present that day. <clears throat> but Jesus was saying, some standing here will not die until, number one, they will live to see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. They will live through the coming of the Son of Man in His kingdom. They will then look back on the coming of the Son of Man in His kingdom. Do you catch the power of that? Now let's make no mistake. The transfiguration was for sure a vision of the coming of the Lord. There's no doubt about it. How do I know that? Well, I read to you from 2 Peter chapter 1, 16 and following last week. We're going to be getting back to that text hopefully next week. But the point of fact is, <clears throat> Peter, in order to refute the scoffers who were denying the second coming, said, we have made, we haven't spoken to you in fables, cunningly devised fables, when we made known to you the power and the coming. Uh, that's what's known as a hendiotes in the Greek, and it means when we made known to you the powerful coming of the Lord, for, for, we were with him in the mount. So Peter is unequivocally, and by the way, almost all scholars agree with this, Peter is unequivocally stating, to, in order to refute the, the scoffers who were saying, where's the promise of His coming? It's not happening. Peter said, yes, it is, because we saw a vision of it when we were on the mountain. And it was that vision that made the prophetic word even more sure. Now, if, if the transfiguration was not a vision of the second coming, then that means that Peter was using something that was unrelated to the second coming to prove the second coming. Really? How, how, how would using an event that is unrelated to the second coming prove that the second coming is going to occur? We'll have more on that later. Okay? So the point of it is, in Mark chapter 9, the force of the Greek text is, there are some standing here which shall not taste of death, they will live until the coming, of the, son, the coming of the Son of Man in His kingdom with power and great glory. They will live through that event. They will look back on that event as a fulfilled reality. Oh, and by the way, let's not forget what Jesus actually predicted. Point number two. Once again, pardon me. Jesus did not predict, there are some standing here, which shall not taste of death until they see a vision of my coming in the kingdom. No. He said, the Son of Man will come in the glory of, of the Father with His angels and shall reward every man. So, the time of the coming of the Lord in the glory of the Father with His angels is the time of actual reward. Now, if you're going to say that the transfiguration fulfilled his prediction, then you're going to have to say a couple of things. Number one, 
I guess I ought to ask this question. <clears throat> Where are the angels in the vision of the transfiguration? I mean, after all, Jesus said, Son of Man is going to come in the glory of the Father with his angels. Now, I ask that question not because I believe that it's a 100% valid question. You know, uh, a lot of people try to use what I call the, the missing elements hermeneutic. And so I'm using this question as a way of kind of, uh, shall I say, poking at that hermeneutic. Jesus, uh, the vision didn't have to include a vision of the angels for it to be a vision of his second coming. If you're going to say that the transfiguration was a vision of Jesus' second coming, guess what? Then everything related to the second coming and they saw a vision of the second coming, then everything related to the second coming is included in the vision. I, I'm just, I'm staggered. I am staggered at times when people say, and by the way, this happens on Facebook all the time. I will point out a given text and the eminence of the text, and somebody will jump up and say, well, that text does not refer to, it doesn't say one thing about the Jerusalem temple, does not mention A.D. 70, therefore, it can't be in the text. Well, you see, on that same identical basis, I could argue. And remember, I'm not arguing. I simply, I'm using their hermeneutic to show the fallacy of that hermeneutic. So, I could use that identical hermeneutic to say, oh, well, Peter said that the transfiguration was a vision of the second coming, but it can't be a vision of the second coming because guess what? There's, there's nothing said about the angels coming. There's nothing said about the destruction of heaven and earth. There's nothing said about the resurrection. There's nothing said about all the nations of the earth being gathered before him at the time or in that vision. Therefore, it can't be the second coming. But do you see the fallacy of that? We have to understand how the Jews thought. Well, we're out of time for today. We have more on the transfiguration and the parousia. I'll see you next week.